line between you and your lunch, so I'll try to give uh, you a good overview. Um, this will not be, uh, because of the topic which is quite broad, it will not be quite as in-depth as uh, previous presentations maybe, uh, but there is a, a, a large scope to cover. So first to say, who am I? Like, uh, Raymond already told you well, I'm uh, head of research of uh, our made unmanned vehicle center, as we, uh, we call ourselves, um, where we are planning a project. Now, in our lab, our fundamental research direction is uh, autonomous navigation and, let's say, visual perception for uh, autonomous uh, robots. So we are working on perception, mapping, control, and uh, visualization, also visual simulation. And because uh, yeah, the army, so we have to work on air ground and carrying vehicles. Um, and what's our vision? Why we use uh, mostly visual perception is if we look at um, humans, our main sensor is our, our eyes. And uh, if we look into robots, they have lasers, they have all kinds of sensors. But uh, if you look at a biological example, you, you, uh, the robots should be able to do all the same uh, with their eyes, so with our cameras. So that's why we work mostly, mostly on visual perception, visual mapping and localization, control and simulation based on that. So that to introduce what our lab specifically is in, involved in, but then for the application scenarios we're working um, on, on multiple topics and I was wondering how I was going to set up this uh, the structure of this talk and then I was thinking that uh, let's say it, it quite uh, literally fits quite well into the topic of this uh, summer school which is safety, security and rescue level, so I uh, made a, uh, an overview like that. On the safety part, we are going to talk about humanitarian demining. Um, that's maybe stretching the safety topic a bit, but I have to put it in. Um, to be clear, you know what humanitarian demining is? Demining is uh, with EOD, uh, explosive ordnance, disposal robots, getting the bombs out. Why it's called humanitarian demining? Well, there is humanitarian demining, there is military demining. We have military academy, we're not doing military demining. Military demining is making a corridor for your troops. You go in a large bulldozer and uh, you hope that the mines aren't smart mines so that they explode on a second uh, impact. But, uh, and, um, but humanitarian demining, it is uh, where you want 100% coverage uh, of, the, of the land. You want to release the land to the population. Next subject will be uh, more security robots, where I'm going to talk about uh, European Defense Agency projects on network multi-robot systems, and also about the European land robot trials, and finally about the rescue robots, on two European projects on this topic. So I got a question yesterday, where is our, are all these projects coming from? Um, well, for the non-Europeans among us, uh, it's maybe interesting to, <laughs> to, uh, to have a, an idea about this. The uh, European Union is, is uh, sponsoring for 50, more than 50 billion euros of the research budget. Uh, 9 billion um, for that goes to ICT and of that 9 billion, uh, more than 600 million euros is going to cognitive robotics. Um, that's over a seven year period. There is also in the security team, 104 billion, and of that 104 billion, about 250 billion euro is going specifically for uh, tools for restoring security and safety in the case of disaster crisis, because crisis management robots. And there is also a European Defense Agency where the nations decide on the fund. So you see, that's where a large portion, portion of the money is coming from. So, safety robots. Um, in Belgium, we have a large uh, experience with uh, humanitarian demining. Why? It's a uh, remnant of the First World War. We, have, we had the front line in our country, and uh, we are still digging up the, the mines. Um, the robots can help with uh, demining. So, we have produced over the years uh, numerous demining robots. This is from the 80s, these robots, uh, legged robots. Uh, why legged robots? Because you need to be able to step over the mines um, or you need to make uh, robots which are light enough so that they do not make the mine explode. 
so also working with spider robots. Uh, these are large demining robots. But all of that has led to uh, what we're working on now, which is <laughs> the Tiramisu project, which is now um, running, which is uh, run by my colleague uh, Professor Boulevard. It's a multinational project where there are 24 partners inside from all over Europe. Um, it has a, a budget of about 20 million euros. And they are working on um, a whole kind, uh, range of topics. So it's not pure robotics uh, research. Uh, it goes from um, the looking to the terrain and finding out where the suspected regions are, to the robotics part, to uh, training the personnel uh, to manage to the mission. All activities which have the intent to release the land to the population as soon as possible. This is really important because if you can release the land to the population, it saves, not only it saves human lives, it also gets the economy running again. So there are these different uh, subjects in, within the Tiramisu project. I'm uh, going to go quite quickly over those who are not related to robotics. So for example, the first one, which is initial screening, which is using satellite images to uh, zoom down on the most suspected regions. Um, then there is going to be a technical, uh, non-technical survey, which is on a more global scale, to gather data, to get, um, to know where the suspected areas are more in detail. And then we come to the, to the robots, to a technical survey, where we need to, de um, to develop robotic systems for inspection. Uh, often these are low-cost agricultural devices which are um, made autonomous or unmanned in every case. Um, some examples of, of these uh, systems here at work. Um, then next topic is standoff and closing detection. Here we're going to really precisely localize where the, the, the individual mines are placed. Taking the mine out is something which is um, currently done by the humans still. Um, but detecting the mines in precise localization is something which can be done by, by robots, be it ground robots or aerial robots. So we can use different kinds of sensors for that. Uh, we can, there are chemical sensors which can sniff uh, the explosives in the mines. Uh, there are uh, metal detectors, ground penetrating radars. Uh, there are other efforts on biological sensors. We can use uh, rats, honeybees, uh, yeah, dogs, excellent sensors as well. Um, so the, uh, the aim of the project is to um, gather all these uh, tools together in order to, uh, to have an integrated uh, tool set. So here you see some of the experiences we have on, on this with uh, humanitarian mining robots. Uh, on the field there, have, there are multiple types of robots. You have wheeled robots, agricultural uh, robots, uh, here you have Japanese spider robots. This is a very advanced system. But of course you have to think about uh, deployability issues as well to get these things to a mine. It's, it's easy. Also on the UAV part, uh, we're working on, um, let's say, um, rotorcraft vehicle type of vehicles for uh, with, uh, with sensors uh, on the bottom to fly over the mine field to detect the mines. Uh, the problem with these kinds of uh, rotor craft is that they have a limited uh, autonomy, electrical autonomy in general. So we're also looking toward blimps and things like that to, to be able to cover a larger field. Um, Next 
tool in the toolbox is uh, protective equipment. That's uh, for the personnel, of course, but it's also for the robots. Showing a picture of an exploding robot always light on top of it. So we have to see that our robots can stand um, an explosion of a mine, which can, which can always happen. Uh, next part is uh, the display <coughs> where you need to get all the dangerous goods off of the field and to a safe area. Also, uh, agriculture, uh, modified agricultural devices can be used on that. Why? Because they are in general uh, they are already there on the field. So you, with a group of uh, tinkering, uh, you can uh, make not of a system out of this. But let's say, unmanned system out of it, which can safely uh, drive the dangerous goods uh, to a safe location. Um, we're also working on training of uh, the deminers, uh, because they need, we, it's, it's good to produce tools, but if the, the deminers cannot work with the tools, it has to be sent. Uh, we're also working on education towards the population, because the population needs to be aware that that is a big, big risk, and on, on mission management. Um, now, the goal of this uh, project is to increase the technology uh, readiness level of all the <coughs> technologies which exist um, drastically. So we have tools which are, have a really low TRL and they're, uh, let's say, one or two and then it's, they go to go up to four or five. We have others which are here at six and then it's, I need to go up to nine. So the idea is really to, uh, we have a whole set of tools and to bring everything up, uh, degree of technology, the degree of technology at a level higher. Okay, so far the safety part, so security robots, so first talk about the EDA project. Um, EDA project, uh, this is called Network Multi Robot Systems, it was uh, born out of a NATO research uh, group on, uh, let's say, standardization for uh, robots for, the, for NATO. So there the goal was to develop uh, in the first project a uh, simulation environment for multi-robot collaboration and then in the second project, which should start soon, uh, to do it with real robots. Um, so we have identified multiple scenarios. First scenario is urban surveillance, so we have created an urban environment in simulation. Um, and the idea is that the robots go and search for intruders in this uh, urban environment. Second scenario is patrolling a military camp where you have a uh, fence around the camp and the robots need to uh, search in the camp for intruders. Third scenario is transportation where the robots need to protect uh, a transport going from one place to another. So that is a um, a lorry going from point A to point B, and uh, the route is not safe, uh, so you, the robots should take uh, countermeasures, they have to take uh, protective formations around the, the lorry, things like that. So there are uh, defensive strategies which come into play as well. So which robots do we use by the simulation, of course? There are uh, small, real robots medium wheeled and tracked robots and uh, larger robots. But it's simulation so it's easy to, <laughs> to do it. <coughs> um, we will use a whole range of sensors uh, in this project as well because we need uh, line vision so it's as well uh, and daytime vision and street 3D vision laser scanners. So what 
other technologies we're working on there, it's uh, the obstacle detection, uh, the, the robots <coughs> think with a man vehicle, let's say, equipped with a, a sensor, needs to detect obstacles and need to be able to avoid these. Um, it's also the intruder detection, um, to find out what is a suspected uh, object, person, in the environment. Um, the detection, so it's uh, positive and negative uh, obstacles. Through the detection. Oh, here is even another tank like vehicle they uh, post. What uh, RMA worked on specifically is also the path planning, so it's multi robot uh, mapping and, and path planning. Uh, because you have to take into account the position of each robot's uh, perspective to the others. You have to take a defensive formation, for example. If, you, if the robot, the worry goes from one place to another, it will, have, will like to form a circle around it, or a diamond, or depending on the, the strategy for, for defending it. We have made our own uh, interfaces uh, for mission management. So, let's say, next uh, subtopic is the European Land Robot Trials. Uh, European Land Robot Trials, uh, these are trials which um, they, they originated, in fact, from the same NATO uh, uh, groups, where we looked to the example of Europe, looked to the, to the example of what's happening in, in the United States with the Dark Red Grand Challenge, and then the wanting to do something on a smaller scale, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we what we want to do is uh, to do field tests with robots in real environments. So it's outdoor, harsh weather conditions. Um, and the focus is on uh, having testing robot systems which are ready now. Um, the the LROP is one year civil, civil uh, LROP and one year military LROP. So this year, it will be the end of this month, it will be military LROP. And last year, uh, it was uh, civilian LROP. The difference, there is no difference in uh, scenarios. Uh, scenarios are, are the same. There is a, a difference in, let's say, participants. Uh, in general, it's more the, let's say, universities and research community which comes to the civilian LROP and more uh, companies uh, which have EUD robots which comes to the military element. Uh, um, but you can participate uh, in any case, so you, there is no restriction for, for anybody. Um, so th there are four main scenarios. Um, you have a robot needs to go to a certain uh, area, that's an approach scenario. So it's uh, here three kilometers away. So there is a waypoint three kilometers away, and you have to go to there. Um, a camp security scenario where you the robot is in a camp and it has to detect intruders in the camp. Autonomous navigation. You get a set of waypoints and you need to go through these waypoints. You get an hour, and if you can make multiple tours, that's okay. It's, okay, it's six seven kilometers, so that's quite a lot. Uh, and then there is mule, a mule scenario, that's also going from military, um, where the robot uh, needs to follow one time a person <coughs> from point A to point B, and then afterwards he needs to uh, repeat that uh, route autonomously. He has to learn a route and then uh, execute it afterwards. Uh, so to give you a, uh, an idea, this is... Uh, Last year, we uh, organized the LRO competition at uh, Military Academy. And we did it here at this military camp uh, in, near Brussels. Um, so this is, is the, the routes the robots needed to follow. So for example, for the autonomous uh, navigation, you see the, the trajectory they had to follow, the green line. To give you an idea on the size, this is a football field. Uh, so it's, it's quite large. Um, participants, uh, well, the, the head of uh, 
Elgop is uh, Frank Schneider from Fraunhofer. So they participate every year. Um, and they're quite good at it because they do that. Um, we also had Lars, uh, which came with a ground vehicle and an aerial, supported by an aerial vehicle. Because we participated last year, we organized last year, we participated as well, of course. And it was University of Hanover, uh, Warsaw, and a number of others. Um, some of them which in the end couldn't make it because it's um, yeah, quite difficult to get your vehicle ready in time. And with outdoor robotics, uh, it's, it's very uh, easy to break something. I have some videos of what happened. So here you see our robot searching for intruders in a, in a camp scenario. GPS on the robot, and here is a, yeah, you cannot see it very well, but a time of flight sensor and a stereo camera for obstacle detection. Um, so they have a Velodyne sensor. Um, but they're also going to the <laughs> trenches. <laughs> so this is a, a hard, hard environment because uh, you go under the woods so you lose your GPS connection. Uh, you go very far so you probably use your radio communication. Um, so you, have, you, go, you will need to go to some water probably. Um, it's uh, hard. You can be asked to go inside a building to inspect. I can give you the video. They are on YouTube, by the way. I just pulled them off. You just type a little 2011. A little whatever. As you see with these high trees, uh, the, lots of teams had a problem that the GPS <coughs> fell off and because they were working on other robots they, uh, they thought that they would always have the GPS but no. <laughs> so there is a, when you go with, uh, with the robots there, is a, <coughs> there are three persons in fact. There is one a representative of, of the team for if everything, everything, anything goes wrong, there is a judge and uh, there is a cameraman. So uh, and they record the time. So what we <coughs> learn from that also from every year we see that there are a lot of teams who uh, subscribe to Elop, but there are not uh, that much who really make it to the end certainly in the autonomous modes, um, it, because of the, the very hard conditions, eh, weather conditions, you cannot arrange for the weather outdoor, uh, terrain roughness, um, you have to be able to rely, uh, to, to be able to cope with a, a bad GPS connection, bad or no radio communication. So I have written here contact of uh, Frank Schneider, if you need to contact him, he is the organizer. And uh, it will be at the end of this month in Switzerland, in two. So, rescue robot. Um, the work we did at, in, we do at RMA, the rescue robots, it started with this uh, previous project, uh, which is in the previous call. On, uh, which is viewfinder, where it was the idea to have robots equipped with chemical sensors working on for search and rescue. So what we did here is, um, a, this is the final demonstration of that uh, program. Uh, we, the 
demonstration was uh, the crash of a fighter plane uh, on a military base. So we had uh, that's the advantage of working in the army. We had an F-16 fighter plane with <laughs> the carcass of it. We put it near a hangar. We threw some smoke bombs in it, and um, that was the exercise. Uh, seeing how the, well the robots and the human intervention teams. So here, as we see, we, we all called for the human intervention teams. The firefighters they came, and they started um, extinguishing uh, the, the fire. Uh, not the real fire, of course, but uh, and then um, the task for the robots for our team was um, dual. We had first to look for the pilots. The pilots had uh, used their uh, escape seat, and so they they are somewhere in the woods, and we have to search for them. Uh, so the human teams they can. Uh, select on the Google Maps like interface uh, a region where the, the robot needs to search. Um, we did that for this for them because we got the feedback that these do, do not really want the robot to intervene too close to, to their working space. So certainly it's a 350 kilogram robot. Um, so here you see the, the robot which is looking for the, for the human victims, let's say. Um, and, and giving an alarm when he when he sees one. Um, so for that we developed <coughs> some autonomous uh, capabilities. That's uh, the victim detection, which is quite simple uh, learning, but, and it only detects people when they're lying down. So there's some improvement to be made there. Um, the robot is equipped with this differential uh, GPS system, so you can. Uh, navigate quite precisely, uh, detects obstacles through the stereo camera here and it avoids those. It also makes uh, a 3D reconstruction of the terrain, a bit like we saw here before with the, with the construction for motion, but because this is four years ago, it's a bit less... Um, so here is to avoid the obstacle. Construction of the terrain, but because it, it's four years ago, so it's a bit less. Uh, hand, the rendering is less nice. But what's interesting is that you can show all the contextual information, like we have a victim here uh, on the 3D model. Um, and after the victim has been found, uh, there is a, a second task uh, which is uh, put up for the robot, which is to go to the hangar, if you saw, if you remember the first uh, pictures, there was a hangar which was in smoke where the airplane, F-16 fighter plane crashed into. Uh, so there are people inside, so the, the robot needs to go to drive through the smoke to test whether these, uh, that it's toxic, and because an F-16 fighter plane contains hydrazine and it's uh, very dangerous. Uh, so you, we drive the robots through the area with smoke and there is a chemical <coughs> sensor on the robot which senses uh, whether there is hydrazine um, present or not. Well it can detect a range of like I think 20 different chemicals. And um, after that there is a, another robot which is going inside of the building to uh, test uh, to have a look at the structural integrity of the building is okay. To, to in, equipped with a 3D uh, laser scanner and it uh, makes a scan to see if the firefighters can enter or not. And these two kinds of information give the, the firefighters the data they need. Uh, they know that the structural intensity is okay, uh, the structural integrity is okay and that there is no um, so that's a 3D construction and uh, that there are no toxic uh, pollutants in the environment so they can go in and, and rescue the the people inside. So that's where we are coming from and for the future. Now we are working on Icarus, that was the previous project uh, we discussed before. Now we are working on Icarus, which is the new project uh, on search and rescue. 
Um, what's the problem we're tackling with Icarus is uh, it's broader than, than uh, the viewfinder project I described before. Uh, Icarus is um, covering land, sea, air, every kind of disaster. Why? Because these disasters they <coughs> disrupt our, this, our society and they're, they're very difficult to handle. We're focusing really on, on the search and rescue uh, part. And what we've seen here that currently search and rescue operations, they are quite slow and, and they are very labor intensive. So we can speed it up if we use robots. But that's why the ICARIS uh, consortium was, uh, was uh, put up. Uh, we're also 24 partners. Um, out of 10 countries uh, and the main end users we have are uh, Belgian first aid and support team that's for the let's say all the land demonstration part and the Portuguese Navy which is for the maritime part um, we have some large industrials we have uh, Elzoni and we have um, Alan Vanguard inside NATO is also involved the budget is 17 and a half million euros so we have put up uh, multiple objectives which we want to achieve and uh, these define our work packages in fact. First one is, is on the sensing part and on the sensing part what we need to, uh, what we want to develop are better sensors for detecting human victims. Uh, so we're uh, developing um, an infrared uh, detector which has in hardware uh, the human victim detection uh, algorithms. So the special thing about this sensor is that it will also be very light, which is special for infrared sensors, so that we can integrate it on unmanned aerial vehicles, which is interesting because then you can have a quick look if you have if you can find human victims. Uh, <coughs> unmanned aerial victims, uh, uh, unmanned aerial systems. That's uh, the second part. Then um, we will use multiple um, aerial. Uh, Systems we will use the sensor uh, by ETH from Zurich. There is a, this is for let's say more uh, long range uh, operations. There is from Skybotics an optocopter which will be used uh, for indoor operations, searching people in collapsed buildings. Uh, there is a gyro pendulum which is uh, able to operate in harsh weather conditions it's, uh, and it's mainly there for sea operations so you can also carry some rescue kits so you can drop uh, let's say, yeah, rescue kits to uh, people who are floating in the sea and there is also, uh, that's not on the slide here a uh, normal, uh, let's say, quadrotor by the Central Technology Aerospatial these are the main partners here we will use these for uh, assessment, uh, getting an idea of the situation, observation of targets, people searching, and um, kit delivery communication relay. We're also working on the ground vehicles, um, several types of ground vehicles. Um, we have large ones for really big uh, disasters to. Uh, Smaller ones, this is one by Alan Vanguard, and this is also one we have here at the uh, Military Academy. Uh, this the idea of this one is to use it as a mobile base, whereas these smaller ones they can be uh, deployed by the larger one and they can go inside collapsed buildings. We're also working on the sea uh, front, um, so there is um, uh, work done on uh, let's say sensing and perception for uh, detecting human victims uh, <laughs> floating at sea uh, and we're also going to develop a new type of uh, rescue capsules which are going to be rescue capsules with a small motor inside such that, such that they can propel themselves towards the victim which is uh, at sea such that the idea is that you can drop the, the capsule um, from a helicopter and then it can uh, move towards the, the drowning victim. But our idea is not to make separate robotic systems. Our idea is to, to bring these together so that the, uh, these robots uh, uh, they can interact and they can collaborate together. 
So uh, robot interoperability is a large issue for us. Uh, we also want to make the ground vehicles and the aerial vehicles collaborate, and the sea vehicles and the aerial vehicles collaborate. So there is really a heterogeneous collaboration between the multiple uh, systems. But it has been brought up, communication is, a, is an issue. Um, so we are also working on communication, new uh, ways of uh, having, ensuring communication in times of crisis. Uh, so we're working on uh, self-organizing creative wireless networks. So that means that when you're at a crisis, you know that your communication networks are probably going to be down or uh, seriously damaged. So you have to use whatever is still uh, there, uh, be it a um, GSM network, be it uh, Wi-Fi, be it whatever. Um, <coughs> so we, have a, we are developing a flexible system which can uh, <coughs> use multiple frequencies. Uh, the frequencies which are there, present and open in the country where we, we need to deploy. Also an important issue, and here I'm going close to what uh, was said before on uh, Nifty, we are working on robot systems, but we shouldn't forget that the, the end users, the people in the field, they already have their uh, procedures, and uh, their uh, tools to, to operate. And if we uh, work separately from them, this is not going to, uh, to work in the end. So we have to make sure that whatever we develop, whatever we develop is um, can be integrated in the C4I infrastructure they already have, the command and control infrastructure, etc. They already have. So this means also, for example, work on uh, getting data from the field teams to the um, uh, command and control center pictures, things like that. And not only that, we also need to uh, train, be able to train the human uh, rescue teams with our robots. Now we're probably not going to be able to uh, give every um, search and rescue team in the world uh, some of our robots to train with. So there have to be e-learning tools to be able to learn to work with our uh, equipment. Um, so that's why we're also working on, on this uh, aspect, uh, development of PC type trainers and simulators to be able to work with the robots we develop. All the Icarus tools are meant to be uh, demonstrated in, in, uh, we have foreseen two large demonstrations. They will be in the year 2015 because we have a four-year project and we have started this year. Uh, first one will be a land demonstration in, in Belgium, in a military base in Belgium. This is uh, more, uh, more or less uh, uh, the, the scenario. This is more or less based upon the, the Haiti uh, earthquake. So the idea is that now when the human intervention teams uh, will intervene, they will be assisted by our uh, robotic rescue teams. And the second uh, demonstration scenario is um, a sea <coughs> scenario disaster, which we wrote actually before the Costa Cordillera disaster, but which is quite more or less that. Um, it's a, a shipwreck near, near the coastal waters. It will be carried out in uh, near Lisbon in Portugal. And there is the idea that the unmanned sea vehicles of Icarus will intervene aided by the aerial vehicles. Thank you. Look at some of our platforms. So that brings me to uh, my conclusions. I have shown you that there are mul multiple threats to our society in, in the safety for its mines, unexploded ordnance, security, its terrorists and intruders. 
And for the rescue part, it's the, the disasters. Robots can serve as a great tool to uh, reduce the risk to human lives, and, but there are still a lot of technological um, challenges. Now, we have talked about these technological challenges, so I'm not going to go deeply further into that. But I just wanted to make the note to not forget also about the, let's say, other challenges. Um, for example, deployability. Uh, when you make the, your, your robot tools, are you going to be able to get them to uh, um, a disaster area in, in reasonable time, in, in a reasonable package? Is it, isn't it too heavy? Isn't it... Uh, too, uh, too bulky to be able to uh, get it in the cargo space of a, of a, of a helicopter, of, a, of an aircraft, things like that. Also, we have to think about integrating everything into the C4I equipment, and most specifically the communication part is, is really uh, a problem. Um, in the robot uh, interaction and training. Um, Another issue is standardization. We are still working, and there is not really a, some, some standardization in the robotics uh, society. So there, um, there, there is some work being done. The ISO, I, ISO IEC, they are working on a standard for, for robots, uh, for non-industrial robots. Uh, NATO is also uh, working on that. There is a NATO working group uh, which is working on the standardization among all uh, NATO ve unmanned vehicles. Um, and maybe it's a good idea because I know that military world and, and scientific world is, is often separated, but there are a lot of sometimes good ideas in military as well. They may have developed uh, some, some very nice uh, um, tools uh, for for these uh, kinds of applications as well. And give you some, some acronyms. Is MAGIC is for um, a, kind of a system for getting uh, data from multiple. Uh, <coughs> they use it for aerial, aerial systems, but it can be used for aerial systems, ground systems, uh, into a central database and distributing the, the sensor information to, to, to everybody. Uh, BML is battlefield <coughs> management, management language. It's a way to um, uh, it's a standardized way of giving commands to troops and robots. Uh, and it's it's quite there is an open standard for that. So these are interesting things to to look into. There, uh, there is also the, the standardization effort on the for software architectures, which is not really working quite well for the moment. Um, but, okay. There are also legal issues we need to take into account. Um, you can make the, the best UAV you want, but if you do not get a flight permit to fly it, um, uh, we, it's going to be useless. So, these things are, are something we as a community should, should uh, address to, to the policy makers and keep, keep on doing it. And we're going to have, a, at RMA, we're going to have a conference this uh, winter on, on opening up the European airspace to UAVs. They want to do it uh, and they are foreseeing it by 2014. Um, also, data protection. I saw when um, uh, Raymond was giving the paper on uh, do you want your picture and some people said why do you need that of course you need that I mean that's the same thing for a robot you cannot take a picture of somebody and not have such a paper so you need to, to take these things into account <coughs> these are also ethical issues that concludes what I want to say thank you so much for that good now, are there any questions? I'm curious to know what you mean by ethical issues. Ethical issues, well, it's, uh, do these robots uh, respect fundamental rights of people? It's 
privacy, um, things like that. It's something in, in every EU project <coughs> now we need to take into consideration. So it's, um, we have checklists we need to go through and these, these are really hard. I mean, you have to, you have to know something, you have to hire somebody who knows the laws on that to, um, to be able to do it. To answer you a little bit more, um, just about a week ago there was an article in the USA Today newspaper and it said the International Chiefs of Police, which is you know an international organization, is going to recommend that if you use a UAV for other than an emergency, that you have to get a search warrant. It, it, for all these demonstrations I, uh, I spoke about, we need to get the permits. Well, you'd have to get more than a permit. You'd have to get a search warrant from a court. That's what they're going to recommend. So it's, it's also something you need to think about when you're doing research in, in robotics and you have to say, you cannot just say I fly my UAV with a camera on it and then if you if you take a picture of somebody you have to take your flight permit into account, you have to take your data protection into account. Yeah. I've got a uh, question I think Adam might lead into this a little as well. Um, you mentioned standardization mm -hmm. um, and I guess Nifty you, is probably an issue um, that you're dealing with there as well. Um, I guess what are the coordinations like between the different programs to make sure that the standards that everyone standardizes on are, you know, uh, are comparable. You know, the wonderful thing about standards is so many to choose from. Any comments about that? Um, we try to get into contact with as many programs as possible, but there are so many of them. <laughs> uh, so, so it's not, not easy. And, um, and in, in Icarus we try to use as much as possible to open source uh, stuff. So, uh, from perspective of, uh, from our perspective, you didn't have some design standards like I think you mentioned some ISO standards. Mm -hmm. So well, we had some other things about fire safety, get the port that you go into, uh, so these kind of things. But more rigorous test procedures for defining standards, where I think would be quite important. And it's something that would be worth all of us discussing as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, it's right there now from this workshop. Yes, exactly. I mean, we're developing new standards as we speak. Um, so yes, this is terrific that we have so many people from these different groups, and this is a great opportunity for everyone to talk together. I know there are other groups being represented out here um, as well, who again, don't really usually coordinate at, at the level where these kinds of discussions can be had. So please everyone take advantage of this opportunity uh, to do so. So thank you once again. Okay, so